So for uh, 3.4, Math 151, we're going to just slow down on derivatives a little bit and just talk about them as rates of change with problems. So we've talked before about um, equations. We typically would say like S of T being position, kind of a height or a left-right motion or something like that. And with these positions, we know that if we take the first derivative of the position, that would be change in location oh, relative to time. So that is our velocity. And we sometimes call that V of T. And if we take the second derivative of position, that would be our first derivative for velocity, which is our acceleration. So we have a situation where we're given this equation and we're told that this represents a ball being dropped from a height of 144 feet. And t is time in seconds, and s of t, the output, is the height in feet of the ball. So notice we're just measuring up and down movement. We're not moving any, any left-right sort of movement or any directional other than just up and down. So this is the height, uh, the output of the height given the time. So first question is this, what will be the instantaneous velocity when the ball hits the ground? In other words, when that ball hits the ground, how fast is it going? So we know that's going to have to do something with velocity, right? So we want to know the velocity um, at the time when it hits the ground. So we need to figure out when it's going to hit the ground, and then we can plug it into to that. And I, I know that this is a, it's a quadratic, so the graph of it looks like a, it looks like a parabola. This is a height of 144. And so I want to know when it hits this ground. In other words, when is it height zero? This would be the point t zero. So first thing I can do is just solve this thing for zero. That's when it would hit the ground. In other words, when is the position, the height, at zero? All right, to go to solve this, uh, I'm just going to subtract 144 from both sides. Divide by negative 16. And it's a negative by a negative, so it's positive 9. So t squared is 9, so t would be uh, plus or minus 3. And now this is time, right? So this is, this is 3. It hits the ground at time 3. And if for some reason, you know, there's some, some symmetry here, negative 3. In other words, if I had, like, thrown the ball 3 seconds ago in such a way that it just hits that height uh, at time 0, it would come back down like this, like this would describe the up-down, but we just, it's dropped from a height, so it's this. So t is 3 at that moment. So we want to find the velocity at time 3. At time 3, it has a height of 0. So we know that the velocity is the first derivative. So first derivative of this, I can do power rule. So 2 times negative 16 is negative 32t plus, uh, that's a constant, so 0. Oh, so it's just negative 32t. So v of 3 then would be negative 32 times 3, which is negative 96. And my velocity now, remember, is change in position relative to change in time. So this is feet per second. So when it hits the ground, it's going at uh, negative 96 feet per second. It feels pretty fast. It might, uh, might hurt if it hits you on the head or something. Or on the foot, since that's on the ground. I don't know. Maybe you're standing in a hole. Um, second question. What is the average velocity during its fall? So we know that the velocity is, is changing over time as t runs from 0 to 3. Uh, but what's the average velocity during its fall? Let's think about average velocity. So average velocity, that would be the slope of the secant line. Right? It's the change in position over the change in time. So if I, uh, I've already know what s of 3 is, I know it's 0. So it's 0 minus s of 0, if I plug that in, this is all a 0. So it's 144 over 3. And if I divide that out, it looks like negative 48 per second. Um, so one thing I want to point out, just a little aside thing, we know the velocity is negative 32t. So the acceleration would be the derivative of the velocity, right? The change relative to the change. 
And since that's just the t to the first, it's negative 32 uh, feet per second squared. That's how fast it's accelerating. That's the pull of gravity. That the acceleration downward, uh, gravity is constantly accelerating us downwards. It's pulling us downwards consistently. So um, sometimes in a physics class, you might hear of acceleration uh, and velocity as being really the same, the same vector, and they are. So here we have another position equation, and uh, t is time in seconds, and s of t is the distance from zero in a left or right, uh, left or right orientation. So like if t is one, uh, notice this is one cubed minus four times one plus two, so this would be at negative four. This would be at negative one. So at time one, this point is at position negative one. So at that position, um, let's find out what its velocity is and what its acceleration is. Um, this is going to tell us if it's moving left or right. So velocity is the first derivative. So velocity of this function is the first derivative of the position. So 3t squared minus 4. And when v is 1, uh, when t is 1, the velocity is negative 1. It's at this position negative 1, but it has a velocity of negative 1. Right, like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's instantaneous velocity. It's traveling in that direction at that speed instantaneously at that moment. How about its acceleration? We know that acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, the change in the change. So that is, um, well, if this is 3t squared, Minus 4, we can power rule that down, uh, 6t, just 6t. 6, positive 6. And I wrote the positive just to emphasize that. So um, its velocity is negative 1, right? Its, its speed is, is traveling away. It's, it's moving to the left. But it's accelerating in the right-hand direction. You can think of that acceleration, if we think back of it as gravity, right? Like it's moving this way, but there's something that's accelerating it in the other direction. It's trying to make it pull it back this way. So that would mean that this is slowing down when the time is 1. So since the velocity and the acceleration are going in opposite directions, it's slowing down. It's still go, traveling to the left. But the rate at which it's traveling is slowing down. That's what the acceleration means. Let's, let's do that for when t equals 2 in this problem, too. So the velocity at 2, well, it's this. So 3 times 2 squared minus 4. That's 8. So the velocity is positive. It's moving to the right. And the acceleration, that's 6 times that t, is 12. It's also accelerating to the right. So it's already traveling to the right and it's accelerating in that direction. Like there's, you could think, almost think of it as there's like a weight over there pulling it that way faster and faster. So this is speeding up. In other words, you can tell when this is speeding up or slowing down according to the, just the sign, S-I-G-N, of the velocity and the acceleration. If they're the same, if they're both negative or they're both positive, it's going to speed up. Uh, and if they are different, then it's slowing down. So here is uh, another position formula. This is just left right position from zero. So zero's here and this this point is just moving back and forth. Uh, or maybe it's just moving in one direction. But whatever it is, this equation describes its, how far it is from zero at time t. So let's do a little bit of analysis of this. And the first question is, uh, when is it at rest? And you, you remember, you, you've heard me talk about things at rest before. So it, mathematically, when we talk about things of being at rest, we don't mean that they're actually still for a long period of time. We mean like they're still at least instantaneously. In other words, when is the velocity zero? When is the speed zero? Like it could be that it's changing direction. That's often the case. 
So let's uh, let's deal with that first. So we know that um, the velocity is the first derivative. So 3t squared minus 18t plus 24. So we want to know when that thing is 0. Uh, I could run it through quadratic formula, maybe factor it. I'll factor out a 3, 0. Uh, this factors to minus 4, minus 2. So when at times 2 and 4, this thing is at rest. And we started at time 0. So here's 2, here's 4. So at these points right here, it's at rest. In other words, the velocity is 0. When is it moving to the left? When is it moving to the right? Well, when it's at rest, it's changing direction. Like, it's probably going to be moving, like, somewhere from the left and then to the right and that sort of thing. So let me think about that. And this is, this is time right now, right? So from time 0 to time 2, at, at time 0, if I plug in a 0, this whole thing evaluates to 4. So the position is 4 at time 0. If I plug a number in here from 0 to 2, like let's say I even plug 0 into this, 0 squared minus 18 is 0, this is positive. So this is, this is positive the whole time. If the velocity is positive, that means uh, it's going to the right in this region. And then it's at rest for a second, and it probably changes state. So I'm, I'm guessing it goes to the left in this region. But let me check it out. Plug in maybe a, a 3 into this. So 3 times 3 squared minus 18 times 3 plus 24. That's negative 3. Yeah, so my velocity in here is negative. So since it's negative, it's going to the left in this region. And if I plug in something uh, larger than 4, like if I plug in 100, I can tell this is going to be positive. So back to the right in that region. So from time, remember this is just time right now. This isn't the actual movement. From time 0 to 2, it's going to the right. Then it goes to the left from time 2 to 4. And then it goes to the right again. And let me get some actual positions here. So um, I've already done when s is 0. Uh, when time is 0, s of 0 is 4. If I plug a 2 into my original function, like I want to know the position at time 2, I get 24. And at time 4, I get 20. So again, notice what I did. Uh, these are the times. So at time 0, I plugged in 0, and it's at position 4, 4 away from, from the origin. At time 2, I plugged a 2 in for t. 24 and at time 4 it's back at 20 which makes sense to me because this starts at 4 it goes to the right to 24 then it goes back to the left to 20 and then it starts going to the right again so in other words if I like actually sketch out this the movement of this actual point so here's 4 here's 20 here's 24 pretend like it's to scale um, at time 0 it's going to the right so it goes to the right and it goes all the way to 24. So from 4 to 24, it gets there in 2 seconds. All right, it's moving to the right. But then it starts moving to the left. And it gets back to 20 by time 4. And then it goes to the right, it looks like, forever after that. So then it just keeps going to the right. So you can see how this point goes doop and then back and then away. Now, what's interesting to me is there's something funny going on with the speeds here. Because it only takes two seconds for it to go from 4 to 24. But then it takes two seconds to get back to 20. Like, this is definitely slower than that. So let's talk about the acceleration of this thing as well. Now, remember, um, it's kind of weird because I'm using two number lines. But in this one, this is time. And this is actually distance. Like, this one is distance. This is the actual movement of the thing. And this is just, is it going left or right in those time sections? So from, from 0 to 2, we know it's going to the right because the velocity is positive. From 2 to 4, it's negative. It's going to the left. 
and then from 4 on it's going to the right. So now let's look at the acceleration. When is the acceleration positive and negative? So the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, right? The change of the change. So this would be 6t minus 18. So when is the acceleration 0? When this equals 0. And that's at 3. So if 3 is right here, this is when the acceleration is 0. It probably changes state here, right? Like it might be positive here or negative here or something like that. So let's just test some regions. So um, anything in here, let's just plug in a 1 and see what happens. So if I plug in a 1, 6 minus 18, that's negative. So the acceleration is negative here. And then after 3, like if I plug in a 10, this is definitely positive. So acceleration is positive here. So notice what I can say. I can say now if it's where it's speeding up and where it's slowing down. From 0 to 2, the velocity is positive. It's going to the right. But the acceleration is negative. It's accelerating back. So in here, it's slowing down. And then in this region, from 2 to 3, the velocity is negative, and the acceleration is also negative. So here it's speeding up. And then I have this region in here. Uh, the velocity is negative, but the acceleration is positive. And then in this region, they're both positive, so it's speeding up again. Again, I can, I can talk about if it's speeding up or slowing down, comparing the velocity to the acceleration. So let's talk about um, just derivatives, just kind of take stock and see what some implications for it are. So if we want the derivative of, um, of this function at this point, we've been doing this definition, um, h approaches zero, the limit as h approaches zero of, so in other words, we say some distance away from, from a, right, in the left right direction. Give us another point. And then we figure out the, the slope of that secant line. That's this, change in y over the, that increment. And then we, we slide h towards 0. We let it be closer and closer to 0. And you know what? If we zoom in really close, if we have a, a function and its tangent line, if we zoom in really close, like I'm going to pretend like I can zoom in really close. Right? Or, or if I zoom in even closer, there's my tangent line, and there's my function. Really locally, um, the tangent line is a really good approximation for the line. And in this case, h is tiny. So a tangent line is also a linear approximation. And the further away I get from a, the bigger h gets, the worse that this is, uh, is an estimate. But that's that limit idea, right? Like we're, we're, we're kind of thinking in the opposite direction. With the limit idea, we're saying let h get really small, and then we like basically let it go to zero. But if I go, well, what if h is really small but not actually zero? Like it's, it's 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. I've gone over a little bit and up a little bit, and I'm going to be pretty close to the line again, right? Like if I go over h, and then I go up, and I'm on the line here, and I'm going to zoom into this. There's my point on the line, and I'm a little bit off from the actual point on the, on the function. But it's a good, decent, linear approximation for it, especially if h is small enough, if I'm, if I'm reasonably close. So again, you can think of functions as linear approximations, local linear approximations. I can say if my, my h is small enough, f of, of a plus h is about f of a, right, like this function right here, this height, plus the derivative times h. Like if the, deriv the derivative is the slope of this line, so if this slope is 2, say, I go over up h, I go up 2 over h. So this is a good linear approximation for um, 
for that without actually, like if I don't actually know the function. Um, f of a is the population of a city. And we know its, its current rate of change. Like we have a pretty good estimate for that. That's basically the slope at that point. Um, and we don't really, like we might have some sort of model for how, this, how the population is changing, but we don't really know. But what we can do is we can say at some future time, a is the current time, like current year or whatever. In the future sometime, h away from the current year, my population will, will probably be pretty, pretty close to what the population is now, plus how the population is changing, right? This is a rate. Change in population over change in time type of slope. That times how much time I'm, I want to project it into the future. And I don't know that it's going to equal it exactly, but I do know it's going to be close to it. It's a linear approximation. Now what I want you to consider is the bigger h gets, the further off this is probably going to be. Because the actual growth isn't necessarily linear. But, um, but locally, if h is small enough, um, it's a reasonable estimate. Here's an example. Uh, let's say f of x is x squared. That's, the rate, that's just some function. We know its derivative is, is 2x. So this 2x is the slope. Like let's say that this is the 0.39, right? The slope of this then is 6. Of this tangent line is 6. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to show you how this works. I'm going to use this information to get an estimate for f of 3.1. So f of 3.1 is f of 3 plus 0.1, f of where I'm at plus some change. That should be about the now plus the slope times the change. f of 3 plus 0.1 is about, well, f of 3 is 9, plus the slope times 0.1. And I shove that into my calculator and I get about 9.6. Now in reality we can actually estimate that. Like we don't even have to estimate that. We know what that is exactly. That's 3.1 squared. And if I do that on my calculator, 3.1 squared is exactly uh, 9.61. Now you see I was off a little bit because this is curving away, right? But what I've done in this picture is I've gone over point 0.1 and I found the point that's back on the tangent line even though it's a little bit off from the point that's actually on the slope since h was small enough that distance was only 0.01 I was off by a hundredth it's a decent estimate for it all right so we actually don't know anything about the function but we're going to estimate f of 3.2 if we know that f of 3 is 2, we know the output is 2, and we know the slope of the tangent line at that point is 5. So f of 3.2 is f of 3 plus 0.2, and that's approximately equal to the output at that point plus the slope of the tangent line at that point times that difference, times that h. Notice that in this case h is 0.2, and let's see, I know this, f of 3, that outputs 2. Uh, the slope is 5. That's multiplied by 0 0.2. So the output would be about 3. And that's how this linear approximation works. So we're going to get use this idea to get a little bit at some, uh, at some ideas around like finance. So uh, C of X is the cost. So we're going to let that stand for the cost of, um, of creating a product. This is the cost the company has to pay. These are out, outward things. Now there's something called the marginal cost. And what the marginal cost is, we can think of it as the change of the cost at a certain point. One way to think about it is, what, would, what is the cost, uh, what is the additional cost for, for the next thing that you want to make. Like if you've already made 10 of these, you've already made nine of these, 
the marginal cost would be the, that change to get to the tenth. If you add one more product, what would the, how much would the cost change? And this is, uh, again, it's marginal cost. This is, it's an approximation. We have the same idea with revenue. Revenue is money that's coming in. And the marginal revenue, derivative of the revenue. And we also have profit. And as you know, profit is revenue minus cost. Right, the money that's coming in minus the money that had to go out. And again, the marginal profit is that is its derivative. In other words, the derivative of the revenue minus the derivative of the cost. Again, think of this as the cost difference uh, if you added one more product. So the revenue of the cost is about... See how that's the cost of just buying one more? The cost of 11 minus the cost of 10 of them. And notice I say it's approximate. It's not exact. And it's not exact because it's a linear approximation. Like if my cost curve's like this, the slope of this, and this could be for cost, uh, this could be for profit, this could be for revenue, for any of them. The, the slope of it, right, is the steepness of this line. Cost at x. This would be the cost at, at x plus 1. But notice if I go over 1 and then up c prime of x, that should be right under that, sorry. I might be off by a little bit, but it's a good estimate for it. All right, we have a formula that relates uh, the price charged per dinner to the number of dinners that are that were sold or, or are being bought or are being sold. So like if you buy 50 of them, this would tell you that your price per dinner. If you buy one of them, you can see that the price is nine. If you buy 10 of them, maybe the price per dinner would be nine minus 0.3. So price charged per dinner, is related to the number of dinner sold. The more that you you um, buy, the cheaper it'll be. And this will have this would have a top limit. Um, this we're not going to let this run forever because if you let it run forever, um, so at most you could buy is, is three hundred. If we let it run forever, um, eventually, like you would be giving away dinners and you would be the price would be negative. So you'd be giving people money to take the dinners from you. So we have a cap on it. How much revenue is earned by selling the 101st dinner? So first off, let's think about revenue. Um, the revenue is the money that came in. So price per dinner, this is how much dinner costs, and we're going to sell this many dinners. So the revenue would be the number of dinners sold times the cost per dinner. So let's clean that up, distribute that, that x into there, 9x minus 0.03x squared. And just for form, I'm going to put the, uh, the squared term in the front. So minus 0.03x squared plus 9x. And again, we're going to limit our input 0 to 300. Now, the question is, what's the revenue earned by selling the 101st dinner? So if I think about the, the marginal revenue at 100. Remember, this is saying... Um, the marginal revenue at 100 is about this difference. What do we get? What's our change by adding one dinner to 100? That gets us up to our 101st dinner. And remember that this is a pretty good approximation for the actual value, which would be the revenue of selling 101 of them minus the revenue of selling 100 of them. Now the advantage to this, it's a good estimate. Um, and it's easier to calculate often than this. So like if I want to go R prime of 100, well, let's see, uh, take the derivative, marginal, negative 0.06x plus 9, uh, plug 100 into this, and I get 3. So according to this estimate, remember this is an approximation, I would get about three more dollars by sell selling the 101st dinner. Now, if I figure, if I want to figure out what it actually is, I can I can plug these in. So I plug in 101. So 
I think a 0.03 times 101 squared uh, plus 9 times 101. And I subtract r of 100 from that. So negative 0.03 times 100 squared uh, plus 9 times 100. Do you see how, like, as a calculation, this is significantly more work than that? But let's see. I shove that in my calculator, and I get $2.97. Right, this estimate I, only puts me off by three cents. It's a really good estimate. It's super close, and again, that's uh, that's that marginal revenue. All right, give those questions a try. Uh, message me with questions or post them in the forum.